how was India able to bring the voice of the global south on the table at the high table when the summit happened? Uh, we saw a number of countries from the global south, in fact, maximum number of countries in any G20 presidency present at the table. I think there were two, three aspects to it. One was we ourselves consciously decided that we would invite uh, countries from the global south uh, as our guests. That's our prerogative. So you had many more global south countries than before in the G20. Uh, the second uh, development, uh, of course, was that uh, uh, the, uh, uh, in a sense, the G, you know, by doing the voice of the global south, the, the summit in January, we really shone the spotlight uh, on, uh, on the global south. And it needed to be done because the global, let me tell you, you know, I, I, I travel a reasonable amount. Countries in Africa and Latin America and Central America and Asia and Pacific, they were very, very uh, upset, I would say even angry in some respects at the fact that these years of COVID, the consequences of conflict, uh, that somewhere, you know, they've just been left out. That their interest, their pain, uh, their concerns was not captured. So our effort was really to get all of that in, and I, th I think we succeeded to a great mission. And India invited a number of countries, in fact nine countries. What was the idea of inviting these countries? All of them, I believe, were countries of the Global South. Well, so no, some of them were actually countries who traditionally attend, you know. I mean, I don't know if you'd count Singapore as Global South anymore. Certainly Netherlands or Spain, they have a tradition of attending. But we did invite, you know, some of the others, uh, Egypt, uh, Mauritius, uh, uh, Nigeria. Uh, so these, these were uh, some examples. Big focus was on Africa, African Union becoming member of uh, the G20. Uh, how does it show India prioritizing its uh, relationship with the African continent? I think uh, today uh, that will certainly be seen. It's my understanding from our own embassies. That's how it is seen. Uh, as India batting for, for Africa. Uh, the, the fact is that uh, uh, actually over the last decade, uh, our development commitments to Africa have increased. Uh, our training uh, and uh, cap you know, capacity building exchanges with Africa have increased. Uh, you know, the bulk of our new embassies which have been set up uh, uh, approval, Prime Minister gave approval for 18 embassies in Africa. I think we set up 15 or 16 by now. Uh, and, uh, uh, and even during the COVID, I mean, Africa saw us step forward. Uh, so what has happened is that uh, uh, that sense has grown in Africa that, look, India is with you. Uh, and certainly for us, you know, it's a historical bonding. There's a lot of uh, uh, emotion in our feeling, in our relationship. Uh, I think it was, and, and you know, I, I regard it as, uh, in a sense, a, a kind of a ethical, ethical outlook uh, that, to me, it's very similar to what we are doing now in India, that in India, uh, the commitment leaving no one behind, uh, that the most poor, the most vulnerable, uh, the most neglected areas, uh, should be brought up to speed, they should be given special care, they should be given opportunity. That's what our domestic policy is about, mm -hmm. you know. So what we are doing at home, we are also trying to do in foreign policy. And I believe it was Prime Minister's personal endeavor as well to make sure that African Union yes, becomes, yes. because he reached yes, out. Yes, very much so, uh, very much so. In fact, uh, it started last year when uh, President Mackie Saul of Senegal uh, you know, told him that, look, our, our case, I mean, nobody's hearing us. And Prime Minister told, assured him that we will, we will, you know, our turn, our presidency is coming, we will do something for you. Mm -hmm. So what he did after uh, some thought was he wrote himself to all the other members and said that, look, India believes that we should uh, make Af African Union a member, so I hope you will concur. And they all did. But it needed somebody, you know, it needed somebody strong, clear, uh, I would say a believer to take that plunge. I believe uh, in last four years, a lot of momentum with Africa. I mean, 
uh, we have seen how you were in Africa several times, you were in Tanzania, and a lot of capacity building in Uganda and IIT uh, being set up. Uh, but so moving on uh, the G20 aspect, uh, the consensus, were there any attempts by the Chinese to sabotage uh, the perhaps conversations we have seen any reports? No, I, look, I, I, I think uh, we had, uh, I, again, I repeat to you, every one of the G20 countries uh, contributed. Otherwise, we wouldn't have got the agreement, the unanimity which we did. You know, uh, Yes, you know, there were meetings when there were differences of views, especially in the ministerial uh, meetings. But I think by the time the summit came together, uh, people were of a very positive bent of mind. And I, I don't think it is, you know, fair to, uh, to really cast any country uh, in a negative light. I think everybody, uh, everybody really uh, did their bit to accommodate, to understand, to find, find some, some way forward. Mm -hmm absence of uh, the Chinese president, do you think it impacts? Uh, look, I think that's their decision who, who represents them. So, climate change was another aspect. How does the G20 summit, the Delhi G20 summit, give direction uh, or a new narrative to dealing with the issue of climate change, something that has been a pressing issue for the world? Uh, well, what there's a big segment you would have seen in the outcome document about a Green Development Pact. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the, the whole issue is how to resource uh, climate action and climate justice.